the people of the member states of the European Union do not have any great loyalty to the central institutions of the EU. You can see that in the very low turnout in European elections. They don't feel an affinity or a loyalty to these supranational states. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for doing me the great honour of inviting me to speak at the famous Oxford Union. As Harold Macmillan once said, this is the last bastion of free speech. Well, in the next 10 minutes, we're about to find out. <laughs> I wish to begin with a personal statement. I'm not about to defect to the Labour Party. <laughs> This is a rumour that was put around, honestly, uh, yesterday by Harry Cole, the political editor of The Sun, and an hour after Natalie had done it, he tweeted the following words, quote, Minister, colon, someone check on Francois. So, uh, no, it's not true. And uh, also, can I thank you, because we had a difficult night at the polls last Thursday, and as a result of that, there are some rumours that there may now be a cabinet reshuffle in which case this is the nearest to a dispatch box I'm going to get for a very long while. So, um, <laughs> can I thank our speakers? Uh, uh, can I thank um, your excellent librarian? Isabel, if I may say so, as someone who's been in the House of Commons for 23 years, that was a brilliant speech. And I suspect that one day you will be joining me, though probably not on our benches. <laughs> can I thank our two excellent ambassadors who both spoke very well. The Dutch ambassador, thank you, sir. I thought it might be a little cheeky to come here and flog my book, um, but it's called Spartan Victory and it's still available on Amazon. <laughs> it's about how we came to live in a free country. Um, and also the Hungarian ambassador, sir, great to hear from you. If I may say so, when you were talking about a Sovietized, centralized state that dictates to the people that live under it, that was the best speech against the motion that I've heard so far this evening. <laughs> that said, I want to thank my two colleagues, um, uh, the treasurer of ALCA. Um, <laughs> good to know the Tory party is still sound on Europe. And uh, if I may say so, sir, that was one of the best speeches I've heard from someone from Slough Comp for a very long time. <laughs> And also my excellent friend from Peru who spoke brilliantly, not least about agricultural policy. I put it to the House, if Paddington Bear is with us, who can be against us? <laughs> now, when your, uh, and this is no criticism, when your officers kindly wrote to me to invite me to come here tonight, they asked me to come and debate the motion, this House believes the EU has a bright future. But they neglected to include whether they wanted me to propose it or oppose it which left me with a dilemma. But I want to tell you I thought long and hard, and after careful consideration, I consulted Sir Bill Cash, it's fair to say he had a view. I have decided, on balance, despite the name, the fact my name is Marc Gino Francois, to oppose the motion. And perhaps that's because I once worked for William Hague. I was the shadow Europe minister under William when he was the shadow foreign secretary. I worked for him for three years. I greatly enjoyed it. It all went well apart from one morning when I would got into the habit of taking him off. And uh, we were with his outer office staff and they brought me a press release at about quarter to 11. They said, can you clear this, Mark? We want to get it out for the one o'clock news bulletins. So I looked at his staff and I went, I said, well, I said, I've had a look at the contents of this press release. And it seems to me that it's very much in line with what we've been saying for the past year or so on Europe. But given that it touches on some particularly sensitive areas of the party's policy, I think we'd be well advised to run it past the boss first, just to make absolutely sure that it meets with his approval. And at this point, they're all staring at me. And I thought, what? And suddenly this voice from behind me said, oh, it's all right, Mark, I've already approved it. He asked me not to take him off in public again after that. After the Second World War, 
quite rightly and for perfectly honourable reasons, many European politicians were avowed that they never wanted to see carnage on the European landmass again. And so they decided perfectly honourably to try and create a series of European institutions that would make that impossible. It was a laudable aim. But even in the, night, the original Treaty of Rome in 1957, it talked about ever closer union, which, if you think about it, must lead to a logical end. So the clue was there from the start. This then led to a process of treaties, each one of which took more and more power to the central institutions of the organisation at the expense of the member states and thus of their electorates. We had Amsterdam, we had Nice, we had Maastricht, which, cre which turned the European Economic Community into the European Union. And we then had Lisbon in this country, all of them without a referendum, all of them without the consent of our own people. Incidentally, the first referendum on Nice, which a floor speaker mentioned, my secretary was getting married that day, and I'd gone to her wedding in North Essex, and as we got out of the car, Mark Mardell, the BBC's Europe editor, rang me, and he said, where are you? I said, I'm in North Essex, I'm about to watch my secretary get married. I said, where are you? He said, I'm sitting outside a polling station in Dublin. I said, right, he said, come on, what do you think's gonna happen today? I said, well, I think she's gonna marry the guy, Mark. <laughs> no, you idiot, he said, the referendum. I said, well, you're the guy in Dublin, not me, you tell me. He said, well, nearly everyone I've spoken to coming out of this polling station says they voted no. So even though the polls say they're going to vote yes, and even though Dublin's supposed to be the biggest yes part of Ireland, I think they're going to vote it down. And that's exactly what they did. They democratically said no. So what did the European Union say? They said, that's the wrong answer, go and do it again. That is not democracy. <laughs> the European Union now has all the trappings of a state. It has a flag, it has an anthem, it has a currency, it has a president, in fact, it has three of them. Uh, very quickly. Isn't the fact that it's a pseudo-state, that it's a fake state, that, that they had to even steal their anthem from the Champions League, that it, 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 it's, it, it, it so it fakes a state in all its real, without any of the real tenets of citizenship that, that can actually bind people together? So I'm not criticizing Ode to Joy as such, <laughs> but it's, one, it's something I haven't whistled very often down the years. And they have a parliament of sorts. So it has all the trappings of a state, but what it doesn't have is a demos. The people of the member states of the European Union do not have any great loyalty to the central institutions of the EU. You can see that in the very low turnout in European elections. They don't feel an affinity or a loyalty to these supranational states particularly to the European Commission, who they can neither elect nor remove by any method whatsoever, whether they agree with their decisions or not. If you want to see national loyalties, look at football matches. If you happen to think that the Eurovision Song Contest somehow transcends that, then I humbly suggest you need to get out more. <laughs> the EU has had some successes, but it's had three distinct failures. Firstly, and unquestionably economically, the EU's share of world trade is shrinking, not growing. It's atrophying because of excessive regulation. It's not competing successfully with the Asian tigers, especially after COVID. The UK, we now are just about to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which gives us access to a trading relationship with a group of countries with a combined GDP of 11 trillion pounds sterling. We couldn't have joined any other trade agreement if we had remained in the EU without the EU's consent. So economically, the EU is shrinking while much of the rest of the world is growing. Second, socially, there are falling birth rates in not all but most European... No, I've taken one. There are falling birth rates in most European countries. They, like us in some ways, struggle with the problem of ageing populations and how to maintain adequate public services with a relatively aging population and thus a, a shrinking tax base. And there are, as the Hungarian ambassador rightfully referred to, 
internal strains within the member states, particularly on the movement of peoples. One of the four freedoms of the EU historically has been the movement of people. Well, you wouldn't think that if you spoke to Angela Maloney or indeed to Viktor Orban. So they're now starting to contradict themselves. Militarily, the EU is not a military organization. NATO is a military organization. NATO has kept the peace in Europe since the Second World War, not the European Union. Some have pretensions to that. President Macron has spoken very often about a European army, but I'd like to know who's going to pay for it. I've been hearing about a European army for 30 years. France just about spends 2% of GDP on defense. Germany, despite the Zeitenwender, nowhere near it. Italy, barely one and a half. France, sorry, Spain, 1.2 on a good day. Europe is simply not paying. So Macron's idea of a European army is for the birds. So to conclude, and I don't want to keep you here long. In fact, I'm hoping some of you will join me in the bar afterwards from Macron Martini. I spoke to the barman earlier. I said, what's it like? He said, ah, he says, it's quite colorful. On the outside, it looks quite strong, but when you try it, there's not much in it. <laughs> but apparently the Chinese are quite keen on it. <laughs> the EU could have a bright future. But not if it carries on the way it's going, not if it continues to be centralised, sclerotic and over-regulated. And yes, we in Britain could have a very good relationship with it. I quote one leading diplomat who said the same. He said very recently, I quote, we will continue to be strong allies in a multilateral context in NATO, the OSCE and the UN in New York. And we are still North Sea neighbours and geographically as close as we always were. I'm confident our relationship will be fruitful after Brexit. The Dutch ambassador agrees with that because he's the man who said it. So vote with the ambassadors tonight. Vote with the Dutch ambassador. Vote with the Hungarian ambassador who's warned us about a centralising state, particularly as there will be a further treaty because the Franco-German uh, axis want it, which will remove all qualified majority voting Sorry, all national vetoes and all votes in future will be via QNV. It will be a fully federal state, even further removed from the people it claims to represent. Vote for freedom. Vote for democracy. Vote for prosperity. Vote with a Hungarian ambassador and oppose the motion. <laughs>